five, four, three, two, one. We are going live and we are live. Hello world and welcome to this first live stream game show where you are the player. And in this game show, I'm going to be coding a compiler in about 250 lines of Python. This was originally a compiler made by Jamie Builds, a coder on GitHub in JavaScript. And all I've done is I've re-implemented it in Python. And in this video, I'm gonna be coding it out, but while I'm coding it out, you are going to be playing. You are going to be answering questions interactively using this website called itempool.com. And I'm gonna show it on the screen when it's time uh, for you to answer those questions. But there are three questions that I'm gonna ask you as I'm coding this. Every 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna ask you some questions just to see if you're paying attention. And they're gonna be relevant to computer science questions, relevant to what I'm coding. And there will be one person who will answer all three questions correctly that I will select as the winner of this game show. And then at the very end, we're gonna host Victory Royale, the victory competition, the victory celebration for this winner, where we're all gonna praise this winner and I'm gonna sing a song for this winner, all right? So that's how this stream is gonna work. Um, we're, we're gonna start off by me explaining to you what a compiler is, how it works, and then we're gonna go right into the code. We're gonna start building it together right here on this live stream. So if you're ready, I, I hope you're ready because I am so excited for this. I love you guys, I've missed you guys, and uh, I wanna do this at least weekly, if not bi-weekly moving forward. So you ready to learn about compilers? All right, let's get started. So let me put this up on the screen right now, this image right here of a compiler. Let me transition, boom, there it is right there, okay? So just take a look at this image for a bit, all right? Just just stare at this image for a bit while I explain to you what's going on here. So this is an image that I pulled from the MongoDB engineering blog, beautifully hand-drawn image that describes a compiler. A compiler is a translation machine. We can think of it as a translator. What a compiler does is it takes one input programming language, be it Java or Python or C, whatever input programming language we want, and then it will output a programming language of our choice. That could be binary, that could be Java, that could be C, it could be any programming language. So the general idea of a compiler is essentially just a translation machine, and they could have any pair of input and output programming languages. Okay, and so in the case of Python, the Python compiler uh, compiles down to bytecode. And so bytecode is the output and Python is the input. So that's the basic idea of compilers, and there's a lot of complexity and a lot of variety in compiler design, but the basics, the, the core essentials of what a compiler is, you can look at in this image. It consists of three parts. You ready for this? The first part is parsing. The second part is transformation. And the third part is generation. Let me say that one more time, and then I'm gonna go into it, okay? Parsing, transformation, and generation. Now let's talk about this. In this image right here, we have an input programming language. It doesn't matter what it is. Let's just say it's Python, and we're gonna turn it into C. That input programming language, let's just say it's a single statement, one line. We wanna translate one line from Python into C. That input programming language, the first step is to parse that statement. And so what happens is we will take that input statement and we will tokenize it. That means we will create a set of, a set of fundamental units uh, that we define, you know, maybe tokens for punctuation, tokens for operations, tokens for strings, tokens for numbers. And we will take all those tokens and we will just set them aside as our vocabulary. Our next part is going to be to create a grammar out of that vocabulary. And the way we do that, the way we show the relationships between different tokens is by creating what's called an abstract syntax tree, an AST. And that's exactly what you're seeing right here. This tree shows the relationships between all of the tokens in that input statement. And once we have that abstract syntax tree, we're done parsing. The next part is to transform that tree into our output language. And so this transformation process can be totally different depending on what we want our output language to be. It could involve, uh, you know, turning a, an operation into a string. It could involve making one word bigger, one word smaller. So there's a lot of different things we could do for transformation here. And that brings us to our last part of the compiler design process, which is, Generation, once we have this transformed abstract syntax tree that's taken tokens from our input text and created a tree out of them and transformed them, 
And then we wanna generate the output code. And that's what that last part is. We take that tree, we traverse it, and we generate the output co code from the transformed abstract syntax tree. Okay, so let me show you one more image before we start coding. And that image is this. Okay. So this is yet another example of an abstract syntax tree. Now, notice that on the on one side you have code, okay? And on the other side you have an abstract syntax tree. Um, it's not a direct one-to-one -one rela relationship, but it is pretty close. And what we are doing is we're taking all of those numbers and those operations, and as you can see in that tree right there, we are turning it into a tree. And the tree shows the relationships between all of them. And then we can apply whatever our rules are to that tree, and then we turn that tree back into an output programming language, but a different one, a one that's syntactically different. So essentially, we are trying to capture uh, a programming language's vocabulary and grammar together. All right, so that's the basic idea. We have a lot to code right now, so let's get right into this. I want you to pay attention, all right? Don't lose your attention. This is a game show. This is not about me. This is about you. You are the player, and you might win or lose. There will be one winner. All right, let's get started. Here we go. So before we even get started, let me just show you um, Jamie's compiler here. Just a beautiful, beautiful example of what a compiler uh, can look like and what it, you know, what was the starting example for me here? So Jamie builds, he's got this beautiful, the super tiny compiler, wonderfully educative example, and he wrote it in JavaScript, right? So here it is, you can see it on GitHub, right? Um, and so we're going to take that and we're going to write it in, um, in uh, Python. So let me make this just a little bigger so you can see what the input statements are here. So basically just take a look at this. So we have an input statement in Lisp, and what it's gonna do is gonna translate that to C. So it's gonna say add 2.2, two, which is Lisp syntax, and it's gonna output add 2.2, two, but in C syntax. The same for whatever that statement looks like from Lisp to C. Now, this series of numbers is gonna output the same thing. It's just two plus two, four minus two, two plus four minus two, but it's different syntactically depending on the language, and we wanna capture that using the code, right? So now let's get right into the code. Transition, bring the camera up, boom, here we go. Yo, shout out to Grant Sanderson, my friend and colleague for, uh, you know, just inspiring me to do this live stream series, like Grant's Lockdown Math series. What a amazing series. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import our libraries. Of course, we're gonna import our libraries. We've gotta import copy to create a copy of that abstract syntax tree. We have to import re for regular expressions, which we're gonna use right now in our first function, the tokenizer. But before we even create that tokenizer, we have to write out our highest level code. I need you to understand what I'm coding out right now, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna write out this highest level function. It's called compiler. And what compiler is going to do is compiler is gonna take that input, whatever that input statement is, and it's going to tokenize it using this magical tokenizer function called literally tokenizer. The output will be a series of tokens. We'll take those tokens and what are we gonna do with those tokens? We are gonna turn it into a beautiful abstract syntax tree. We will take that abstract syntax tree and we will transform it into a new abstract syntax tree, one that is in C format. And eventually, once we have that new abstract syntax tree, we will stringify it using the code generator function and return the output, which is gonna be in C. So you see here, in four lines, I de define our entire compiler for us right here. So this is really the highest level. So now our job is going to be to write out each of these four functions. So I hope you're ready because we got some code to type, boys and girls, um, and you know all genders. Here we go. So def tokenizer. Here's our first function, the tokenizer. And once I finished with this function, guys, and gals, then we will have the first question. So I hope you're ready, here we go. So we have our input expression and we wanna create a series of tokens. How do we do that? Well, we are going to first of all store where we're at, where are, we, where are we iterating through this array, this list of tokens? And so that's what we define first. And now we're going to create three variables um, that will define 
the search strategy that we're using to look for the alphabet that we're using to look for the uh, numbers and the white space. So that's what each of these are, right? And so, so we have A through Z, and then we have, sorry, so the letters A through Z are our alphabet. And again, we're using that re-library that we just imported. Let me make sure I'm not covering up this code. I got you guys. I know what's going on. I was rehearsing earlier this week. Okay, so we have re.compile R09. Okay, so that's for our numbers. We wanna capture all of those numbers, zero through nine. And then lastly, we wanna capture the white space. Like where are we not, where do we not see some code? And that's our white space. Okay, so that's it. Those are our three um, initial search variables to help us create our tokenizer. And now it is time to iterate through this thing. We will iterate through this input expression as long as it is, thank you Python for that L-E-N keyword. And as we are, we're just iterating through this thing. We're, we're just jogging along through this input expression. Where are we at? We are at the current index. It's going to give us a single char. Now we have to check what is this char? What, what are we even looking at here? Well, it turns out that the char, it turns out that the char, it might be a white space. Like there might not be anything there. And if that's the case, if we can't detect something, well, we just gonna, we're just gonna keep on iterating. We're gonna say current equals current plus one, and we'll continue, all right? So that we don't wanna do anything with white space. We don't want to tokenize white space. White space means nothing to us. It is irrelevant, okay? It is like the Elm programming language. Oh, okay. Everybody, you know, I don't have anything against Elm. I, I think it's actually pretty dope. I mean, a Hacker News, People really love Elm, and Hacker News is really the only news that I look at to be totally transparent with you guys. I love Hacker News. Like, when everything else is gone, I will just still look at Hacker News because those are my people. You know what I'm saying? Like, hackers, we, we're our own thing, you know? So, if we find an open parentheses, we're going to store a, our first token for that open parentheses. Let me make sure that it's all there. Let me make sure I'm a little smaller. I don't need to be so big. Just a giant head right here. Let me, boom, there we go. Okay, so um, we create our first token for the left parentheses, and we're going to keep on going here. We have our first token, we're gonna continue, and we have our next token which is a closed parentheses, right? So these are expressions. Remember, our input is an expression. And as such, we want to capture all parts of that expression. Expressions can be nested and nested expressions have nested parentheses. And so we wanna be really careful about how we're capturing these parentheses and what this type really looks like, okay? So these are, we are appending that initial token list that we define at the very beginning. And um, we have that for our open parentheses, we have that for our closed parentheses, and now we are going to do it one more time, but this time for our numbers, right? And this is why we define those variables at the very start. This is why we define those variables at the very start. Because we wanna say, let's take this empty value and let's start doing a nested iteration inside of it because a number doesn't just necessarily have one digit. It could have two digits, it could be three digits. And so that's why we have this nested function here where we are iterating through every digit in a single number. And we're saying, what's inside of that thing? Let's capture it all. And once we've got the entire thing, then we'll break out of that while statement and we will append it. We will append it just as we did before, but this time with a number of type value, which is the number. Okay, and so there's that. And we're just gonna copy and paste this twice because it's essentially the same thing here. What was the next thing we wanna look for? The answer is our alphabetical, like the alphabet letters. So we'll say alphabet. 
Mm -hmm. And then we say read.match. We're not looking for numbers. We're looking for alphabet. And the same thing with strings, right? A string can contain multiple chars. So we want to, um, we want to look for all of those chars. Name value, da 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 da, continue. And we continue. And then finally, we raise the value error. Okay, and this brings us to our first question. I hope you guys are ready. We wanna put this value error, by the way. We, we wanna say, what are those? I had to say that out loud because we wanna know if the char we're encountering is not actually a symbol that we predefined as a token. What if it's some random thing, right? So that's, that's what we wanna do. All right, so now on to our first question. I hope you guys are ready. So um, here we go. Let me pull this up, the browser poll. Here's the browser poll. Um, I'm going to ask you guys a question and I will begin accepting answers right now. Let me move my camera to the side right here. All right. And so here is this first question that I've got for you guys. Okay. So the first question is what fundamental computer science process can we use to traverse our tree data structure? Because we have just created this, um, I want you to go to itempool.com slash LL source LL slash live. And I want you to type a name in whatever name you want for yourself. It's temporary. And I want you to start answering questions. We're going to see those questions in real time on the screen as students answer them. So I want, I want to see you start answering questions, open that up in a different browser and start answering questions. Okay. So this is the first of three questions. What fundamental computer science process can we use to traverse our tree data structure? Is it A, inheritance, B, recursion, C, polymorphism, or D, garbage collection? Those are the answers. Those are the three possible answers. Now, in the meantime, I'm going to answer questions from you guys while you guys um, ask these questions. So let me answer some questions now. Guys, don't post it in the chat. Post it in the... Um Pose it in the, actually answer this. Look at this in real time. Look at these bars. Isn't this sick? Like you guys, um, let's see. What are some relevant questions here? Would you go for an actual compiler? Um, can we do another language? Listen, um, I, we can do a different compiler. Sure. I mean, we can do a different language. I know you guys want different languages. You know, I mean, Python is what I've been coding on mostly for this channel. So we're going to start with Python um, and then we're going to keep going. Okay. So we're going to have different languages over time. And um, all right. So we have our first um, set of answers in, and now I'm going to reveal what those answers were. We're going to see who is answering these correctly, okay, eventually. Um, one more question before I do this, which is um, someone asked, is it a good idea to write a compiler in Python? I mean, the speed issues that Python gives, it's slow, right? Absolutely true. This is not something that you wanna write for uh, you know, production use. Um, and let me post this link in the chat as well, because I want to make sure that you guys have this. All right. So, okay. Now I'm going to reveal the answer to this. Here we go. Finish and reveal. The answer was B recursion. If you got that right, congratulations. You are my hero, heroine. And, uh, you have only have to answer two more questions correctly. If you didn't answer it correctly, then you're already out of the game. I'm sorry, but still, please stick around. This is still going to be useful. We want to honor the winner of this game. Last question before we continue going. Why do you have that thing in your nose? Because I don't work for anybody. I mean, in a way, I work for you guys. I mean, but, you know, I don't have an employer who's like, you can't wear this on your nose. You can't have this. I'm free guys. And I want you guys to be as free as well. So just be yourself. That's the point. Whatever you see on me, just take that as an example to be the craziest, weirdest, most inner version of who you are deep inside that society doesn't necessarily like. Whoever you are deep inside when you were a six-year-old, seven-year-old, when you were a little small child, don't let that die within you. Always keep that alive. Let the fire burn forever. So, you know, whether or not you like my like jewelry or whatever, um, just Use that as an example and get inspired to do your own 
expression, self-expression, whatever that is. Let's keep going, guys. Um, browser poll's gone. All right, we're gonna keep on going. We had some great, we had some great answers there. Okay, so we're gonna keep on going. The answer was recursion. Now, I also wanna explain why recursion is the answer. So when we create a tree, we will create a tree recursively because a tree is inherently a recursive data structure in that the nodes connect to children nodes, child nodes, and those child nodes can sometimes have pointers back up. And um, the way to create this is to use recursion. And recursion is a concept in computer science where we have a function that essentially calls itself until we hit what's called a base case, which means that the function then stops. And recursion isn't always the best solution. You know, sometimes simple iteration works, but in this case, we wanna use recursion. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so we had that first um, function that we wrote out, and now we're gonna write out our second function. And our second function is gonna be the parser. We have those beautiful tokens. And it's time to parse them all. Okay, so we have those tokens. We wanna to create that abstract syntax tree using recursion. That was the answer to the last question. So inside of this parser function, we're gonna have this nested walk function. And the reason we are nesting this walk function is because we are going to use it recursively right now to build out this tree. And this tree is going to, this tree is going to contain a bunch of nodes of all the different types that we have. And You know, depending on what type we ha we encounter, we're gonna let me remove this um, browser poll. Okay. Now, depending on the type of value we encounter, we're gonna create a different type of node. So, number literals are for the numbers, right? That seems obvious. So there's nothing recursive inherently about number literals, but there might be about a different type of token that we might encounter. If we encounter a left parentheses, if we encounter a left parentheses, then that means that we are at the start of what's called a statement. And when we find a statement, then we want to Oh shit, what is this music? No, not yet. So <laughs> I don't want to play the music yet. The music's for the end. I'm so excited for this song. I'm going to play at the end, guys. Oh my god. Okay. Let me um Guys, I know you want the start of vids. Um I mean, I hear you. I hear you. All right. I'm going to give you guys what you guys need. All right. I'm here for you guys. Um, let's, okay. So where was I? So this call expression, um, this call expression, th this left parentheses is a start of what's called a call expression, which is essentially a nested statement inside. So, you know, you can have like two, plus two, plus two, in, you know, with like parentheses, parentheses, parentheses inside, right? So there's the order of operations, right? So like what order do we want to compute these operations? And so that's why we have this call expression because, oh, thank you, Christian. Global current token, da, 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 params. And so this call expression is gonna have one extra parameter, which is an empty list. And the reason it's got an, the reason it's got an empty list is because it's gonna have children, right? Because a, a call expression can have nested call expressions inside of it. And, and so, um, we want to capture those nested call expressions using recursion. And so that's why we're using recursion because uh, we do have nested expressions inside of expressions. And so 
How do we know when to end this recursive loop? Well, whenever we encounter a right parentheses, that's when we know that the statement and all nested statements are, are finished, but not until we encounter that right parentheses. And thus, we will have this while statement that says, take the parameters and, a, and add to that parameter list the results of the walk function. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to stare at this line right here because this is really the meat, the core part of this function, this nested recursive function. And so our token, we're gonna to capture that token and we're going to continue iterating, return the node, and finally raise a type error. Boom, there's our type error. Okay. Now, now that we have all of that stuff, now and only now, can we build our beautiful abstract syntax tree. The head of this tree is gonna be called program. The body of this is going to be a list. Now, while um, we are iterating through every single token that we generated previously, take that AST that we just defined, starting with the head program, and just continuously build it using this walk function recursively. And at the very end, we can return that entire thing as a brand new, fully functioning AST. Okay, so take a look at that. The code is in the description. Just stare at Parser for a bit, um, and we're gonna keep going. Now, I said that there was gonna be four functions. Um, you know, that wasn't exactly true. There's one helper function that I didn't mention. I just wanted to sneak this one in there. It's called the traverser. And the reason we create a traverser is because our transformer is going to need it. So what we've just done is we've parsed our input into a series of tokens, and then we have turned it into a tree, an abstract syntax tree. And now our next part, part two of three of turning, of building a compiler is to transform that abstract syntax tree. Now, how do we do that? Well. In order to transform this thing, we're gonna need some kind of helper functions to be able to traverse through that um, list. Essentially, it's a data structure um, that we can store in an array, and we're gonna call this function called traverse array, and inside of it, we'll have traverse node. Now, traverse node is really the main function here. Traverse array is just the highest level outer function. And Okay, okay, I'm excited, I'm very excited. I wanna make sure that I'm not going too fast here. Okay, so inside of traverse node, we wanna store a reference to our AST and we want to make sure that we're getting the head node, the program node at the start. Now, once we have that, we wanna traverse through every different node type, but the way we traverse is gonna be different depending on what type of node we encounter. So for example, if we encounter a program node, then we will traverse through that node as such with this line. But if we encounter, if we encounter a different type of node, I want you guys to continue paying attention. We still have two more questions, by the way. Don't go anywhere. We have to have this winner. This whole, this whole live stream is just for the winner. Like we are dedicating everything to the person who gets this correctly. Now, where was I? So as we're traversing through all of these individually, so we're going to do different things. So this is why you have it individually, because in call expression, we have this nested property called traverse, called params, which has nested call expressions, right? Children of children, children of children nodes. And so that's why we have it differently for each of them. And so, um, but the thing is, if we encounter a number literal, if it's, just a, if it's just a number, we don't have anything nested there, right? So we don't have to, um, we don't have to do anything wildly different. We can actually just break from that. We can say, okay, we encountered a number literal. There's nothing to traverse here, right? It's just like, it's by itself. And so, um, but the thing is, 
the thing is, um, if we, oh, hold on. This is else if, if, else if, else if. So like, I think this was in switch statements in Jamie's original code. Yeah, it was, it was, Jamie actually wrote out like switch statements, but unfortunately we don't have that in Python like built in. So we're just gonna do these if, if else statements. That's okay, it still works out. Um, so now we'll raise a type error if we don't, don't encounter a node of whatever type we have, we'll print it out as the error. And lastly, we'll call traverse node, which means that we're done. Now we're gonna get to on to our second question. It is time for our second question. Here we go. Okay, here we go, guys. Question number two, I want you to be ready for this. I want you to be so ready for this. Here we go. And while I answer, while I show you these questions, I'm going to be answering your questions. So give me your questions. Okay. The second question is, what type of search strategy, depth first search or breadth first search, should we be using to traverse this tree? Okay, should we be using depth first search because it's more memory efficient? Should we be using breadth first search because we're trying to find the shortest path? Should we be finding using depth first search because our tree contains cycles? Or should we be using breadth first search because we are using an undirected graph? I want you to answer that at itempool.com slash LL source LL slash live. We're going to see answers on the screen as I answer your questions. Let me answer some questions here. Um, Antonio asked, what about multiple parentheses? Will it compute it correctly? Yes. And so that's why we have that nested expression, right? That's why we're building a tree recursively because, you know, a call expression like two plus parentheses, two plus four, right? There, there's a nested expression inside of that. We have two plus two plus four, but a nested version of that is two plus four, right? There's smaller parentheses. And so that's why we have a tree. We want to point to all of those nested expressions. We have two people, three people who just answered. These are coming in. Wow. We have so many different responses for this one. Like I said, guys, this is going to be harder than the previous question, right? These are going to get increasingly difficult. And the last one is going to be my favorite question. Okay, let me answer one more question here um, before we continue here. Um, Sarah asks, where did you get that jacket from? I actually just bought it on Amazon yesterday. And I, not yesterday, two days ago, and I've been waiting for it to arrive. Um, guys, this is gonna be recorded. Um, so you, if you can't make it right now, you can watch it later, but please stay because this is a live game, all right? Um, I thought he was going to use LLVM or something guys. I'm not that, um, good where I'm just about to like code out LLVM from scratch live in an hour. In fact, I don't even think that's possible. Shout out to the guy who made LLVM. Let's talk about LLVM for just a second. LLVM is the Apple compiler. Um, GCC is like LLVM's competitor. Um, LLVM is used in Xcode. If you have a Mac, you got LLVM. Um, one of the things I've always wanted is to look at the implementation files of LLVM and like everything iOS, but unfortunately I don't work at Apple. So I did have a friend who worked there and showed me once. I don't want to say too much. Okay. Let's see the answer guys. Finish and reveal. The answer is a depth first search because it's more memory efficient. Let's talk about that. Okay. So breadth first search, um, it can be more efficient in terms of, of time complexity, but not in terms of space complexity, because with breadth first search, we're going horizontally, right? With the breadth before we're going into depth. But in this case, because our input statements are so small, because they're single lines, depth first search is going to work great. And also depth first search is most often used in simple trees as we have built right here. Okay, so now we have got to question two. If you answered that correctly, there are seven people who answered that question correctly. So we have seven people who could potentially be the winner. Of those seven, one will win by answering the third question correctly. It's coming up. We're gonna get back to coding and then it's victory royale. Here we go. Browser poll's gone. I'm gonna be in this little corner right here all by my little lonesome and you guys, of course. 
And we're going to continue. Here we go. Let me continue. Now, the last question is going to be my favorite question, guys. So I hope you stick around for this last question, which is my... I just love that question. I, I, I made it with my heart. Not just my intellect, my heart is in the last question. So if you want to see my heart, wait for the last question. Here we go. Um, Where were we at? What did we just do? Well, we just built this... We just built this traverser to help us build a transformer. Let me make sure you guys can see what I'm doing here. Okay, transformer. Okay, so now it's time for part two, the transformer, right? Part two of three. We have to transform that new AST, that new abstract syntax tree. Um, oh, uh, we wanna transform that new abstract syntax tree. Let me also show you this really quickly. Um, I'm gonna copy and paste this right from Jamie Builds so we can see what the transformation looks like. This is this is gonna be really helpful for you guys. All right, here we go. Just take a look at this for a second. Um, these are what each of our tokens could look like, right? Just like this. And once we have those tokens, we built our abstract syntax tree, just like this. This is what it looks like. Nested value. See, look at this nested call expression. Got the parameters, nested number literals, just like that. Okay, and so we wanna transform this tree into a new tree. So we're gonna to have to traverse through this entire thing using this transformer function. Let's get back to it, okay? So we'll take that AST, and well, first of all, we're gonna to have to define our new AST. Our new AST is gonna be, the head is gonna be a program. It's a new AST. Now. What's inside of this new AST? Is there, is there anything inside of it? Is it just an empty new AST? Well, right now it's empty, but we don't want it to be empty. We wanna fill it up. We wanna fill it up with all of the context of the previous AST. So essentially what we're doing is we're using, this is where we're using that copy function that we imported at the very beginning to create a copy. Now, once we had that copy of the AST, we're gonna write out a property so we get a way to link back to it. And now that we have that, it's time for our two helper functions. So here's the thing about Python versus JavaScript. Um, the thing about Python is that, you know, there's not a lot of built-in traversal constructs in the language itself. So we're going to have to write out these traversal functions um, separately, one for the call expression and one for the number literal. So we can actually start with the number literal and we can say that when we have a pointer to that context, we're going to add to this new AST a whole new type of node, a transformed type of node called a number literal. And that number literal will have a type, will have a value that is, well, the number literal, the number literal. Okay, so that's our number literal traverser. And um, once we have all of that, we can then call that helper function, that traverser that we first had, and we'll call the traversers separately, one for the number literal traverser, which I we just uh, wrote out, and then one for call expressions, which we didn't write out yet. That's still to write, but we're gonna call it call expression traverse. And at the very end, we can return that brand new, fully transformed AST. And now let's go back and now write out this call expression uh, traverser. So call expression traverse is going to take is going to first create a call expression node. That call expression node is going to be of type call expression. And it's going to, it, this is a new type of node. It's new in that we have a property called call E, which has a type called identifier, which needs to be spaced properly. And it's got a name which is the parent name. Now, remember, call expressions are, they can be nested. And so 
we want to set the current context to his child args. And now we're gonna store the nested call expression. So there, here's our nested part, what I'm talking about. When we say that call expressions are essentially, essentially nested statements. So if we find a call expression, then we will create a new expression of type expression statement Make sure it's visible. And the value is the expression node. Um, I think that's it. Oh, and then one more line, parent context. Okay, so that's it. Okay. Um, and so this is how we are transforming that original abstract syntax tree into the new abstract syntax tree. And now we have one single function left before we get to that last question, guys. We have transformed it. And now it is time for the code generator, part three of three. Guys, this is part three of three. I hope you're paying attention. We now have this transformed abstract syntax tree. And we are ready to go node by node through that abstract syntax tree and convert those Lisp expressions, those transformed Lisp expressions, shall I say, into the proper, the proper C expressions. And we're gonna iterate through every single value in the body of each node until we have iterated through every single type of node that could possibly exist in the abstract syntax tree. And um, if we encounter an identifier, that's the, ex that's the, um, the name, whereas the number literal, uh, hold on guys, by the way, five more lines before we get to the last question. I hope you're, I hope you're still sticking around. If we have the number literal, we're going to return the number itself, which is going to be inside of that type value. Um, I know that there's a little area here. Hold on. Um, else if node type expression statement, Thank you, autocorrect, autocomplete. Then we're going to generate that entire expression recursively using the same function that we're in right now. Okay. All right. Expression return. Expression. Last else if. Here's the last one. If we have encountered a type we have never encountered before, if that type is a call expression, then we'll take that first parameter that we defined earlier, call E, that unique parameter, and we will generate, did my stomach just rumble? I guess I'm hungry. The brain needs some food. That's okay. Call code generator call E params equals Now we're going to join it recursively. Thank you, call expression, for being so recursive. All right. Uh, okay. That's it. We're done. Raise type error. Okay, no type. Um, all right, guys. You ready for this? You ready for the last question? Are you ready? You ready? Here we go. No type. Okay, let us, um, let's see here. Let's see, let, let's see here. Let's just um, build this out here. Let me switch out the, um, 
I'm going to compile and run this for you guys. I don't want to just have this here without actually having an output. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up this code window and we're going to make sure that it works and I'm going to show it to you on the screen right now. You ready for this? You ready for this? Okay. Um, where is it? Code editor. Make that visible. Uh, no, browser poll, not browser poll. Jamie's compiler, transition, compiler demo. Okay, um, and where's little old me? Okay, um, so we will see what the output is. Oh my God. You can just type this in the collab if you don't wanna run all the dependencies. Hold on. Oh my God. Did I really not? <sighs> guys just run this locally using main okay let's get we we're running out of time we've got 13 minutes left let me um it's uh the github link is there it works just there are no errors let's get this last question up there browser poll uh james compiler code editor okay camera okay um browser poll Okay, let's show that last question. The last question, begin accepting answers. Okay. So, the last question of this battle royale, of this game show is, given what we've just learned about compiler design, what project offers a glimpse into the future of compiler design? Is it A, Bitcoin, B, AlphaFold, C, Python 3.9, or D, GPT-3. Think about what we just did. We created a rule-based system to interpret an input. We took some input data. We defined a series of rules to process that data and create an output. Now, what has that kind of parallel? What have we learned about before that has that kind of parallel? Well, we are taking an input language and we are creating an output language. Now. These are programming languages, but maybe the same thing could be done for human languages, right? Maybe that could be the case. And what does that look like? Okay, so let me answer some one last series of questions before I reveal the answer to this. We've got some very, you know, even number of people for all of the uh, possible choices. And can you make a video to build a simple programming language? Uh, Kumarash, I got you. I got you, bro. Guys, I don't know anything about programming. I'm just here to chat. That's what Ganesh says. That's It's all good, bro. You can be what, what did Logan Paul do? Guys, why are you mentioning Logan Paul in this stream? <laughs> Logan Paul is hilarious. Dude, Logan Paul's apology video is the greatest apology video of all time. I mean, um, can you make a video on this? Well, some people know exactly what the deal is right now. Okay, we're going to find out. I'm going to reveal the answer now. In five, four, three, two, one. Okay, finish and reveal. Here we go. Here we go. The answer is GPT-3. Exactly. Let's see who won this game. I'm going to now end the session. I mean, for the. No, I'm not going to end the session of us, just for this um, code. I'm going to view the results. I'm gonna look at the details and I wanna see, let's see, Erastus, Tanjim, Harold, I'm reading all these names. Who got them all correctly? Did anybody get them all correctly? Let's see. One person got them all correctly? Oh my God. Okay, so the winner is Deep Doshi. Deep Doshi got every single question correct and wins Victory Royale. Guys, Deep Doshi is the winner of this live stream and we have to praise Deep Doshi. Everybody, I want you right now in the live stream to praise Deep Doshi as I sing this song for him. Here we go, guys. It is Victory Royale. The winner is Deep Doshi. Oh, before we start, one question. May I ask what system you're on right now? I'm on a Windows uh, computer. Like what computer? 
Okay, so guys, my GPU is a 1080 Ti. That's, I think, the main thing you're asking. It sucks. I'm going to get the new RTX uh, 3 Series, like the middle price one, the 500, 600 one. Um, NVIDIA, if you're listening, you should just send it to me, <laughs> but probably not. I'm just going to buy it, um, and that's going to be great. I'm really excited to get a new GPU because all of this stuff um, really gets in the way. Last question before we celebrate Deep Doshi. Yves asks, what would the most important part of a perfect programming language be, like to create a programming language? That's a great question, Yves. Um, so let me just first start off by saying that I've never created a programming language from scratch that anybody has used. I mean, I've, I think once in like one, I mean, I took compilers back at Columbia and I think we had to create a simple programming language a long time ago. Um, but if I were to create one today, I would focus on um, readability. I would focus on data manipulation as built-in libraries. And I would focus on scientific computing as a built-in library. So basically like I would make Python with NumPy built in and pandas built in and maybe the import structure of Go. I mean, if you guys have ever programmed Go, Go is so beautiful, the way they import libraries. Last last questions, I can't help it. Rohit asks, is there a good and simple book for beginners on compilers that you recommend? I actually don't recommend a book for you. So the way I learned this was by looking at Jamie Build's um, videos and his code. I really encourage you to go on GitHub, type in compilers. Hundreds of examples are going to pop up and I want you to read all of those examples. All right. So, um, here we go. Let's, let's sing this, uh, song for the winner. Hold on. Here we go. Oh, we've got to restart this thing. Hold on. Here we go. Yo. This is for the winner, guys. Deep Doshi, my king. This video is dedicated to Deep Doshi. Everybody, I want you to praise Deep Doshi right now in the live stream, okay? As I sing this for him. This is for you, Deep. Legends never die when the world is calling you. Can you hear them screaming out your name? Legends never die, they become a part of you. Every time you bleed for reaching greatness, relentless you survive. They never lose hope when everything's cold and the fighting's near. It's deep in their bones, they'll ride into smoke when the fire is fierce. No, pick yourself up, cause legends never die when the world is calling you. Can you hear them screaming out your name? Legends never die, they become a part of you. Every time you bleed for reaching greatness, legends never die. They're written down in eternity. Okay. Oh my God, I'm so hyped right now. Guys, Deep Doshi, you are the king. You are the winner of this victory royale goes to you. I want you guys to subscribe if you like this video. We will do this every single week. We will light the world on fire. We will get everybody excited about computer science. I am not stopping. This is just the beginning. And I love you guys so much. I love this community. And I'm here for you guys. I want you to tell, if you like the stream, like the video, subscribe, and go tell one person about how much you love computer science and how much you love compilers. Go spread the word, all right? Um, I love you guys, and I'll see you soon. I have videos coming out next week with William Lin, the original competitive programmer, and Erikto after that. I hope you guys know those names. We're gonna continue going live. I love you guys. Peace out. I love you. Okay, bye. Here we go.